This is Pastor Gabriel Swagger, and we are excited to have you joining us tonight for our Crossfire services right here on the Sunlight Broadcasting Network. You're going to hear music that's going to be uplifting to your heart, preaching of the Word, anointed, I should say, preaching of the Word that will change your life. So stay right here on this channel for a great, great Crossfire service. We're going to go to music, then we're going to come right back with the preaching of the gospel. So don't move a muscle. We'll be right back.
tell you, when they begin to see it, something on the inside of me begin to roar, just begin to bubble over. Because on this thing that we call life, it's a race. And we're not racing to see who gets there first. We're just racing to see who just gets there. And on this life, there's going to be some ups and there's going to be some downs. There's going to be some mountains. There's going to be some valleys. But if you got Jesus holding your hand, I said, if you got Jesus holding your hand, no matter what Satan tries to come against you with, you're going to make it through. I said, you're going to make it through. Come on, one more time. Jesus, hold my hand. this race you may be seated if you can this morning you see young people that's a truth in that song that we've got to get a hold of in our spirit because you can have your best friend running this race with you and they are he or she will let you down at times they will go away at times they will fall themselves but when you have Jesus Christ holding your hand I said, when you have Jesus Christ holding your hand, no matter how many times you fall down, he'll be there to pick you right back up. He'll be right there to dust you off. He'll be right there to pick you back up and put you back on the right path. All you've got to do is reach out right now and say, Lord, I've got to have you. I can't do this by myself. I can't run this race by myself. I can't do this all alone. I've got to have the helper. I've got to have the one who died for me at Calvary's cross 2,000 years ago. I've got to have you holding my hand. Come on, just one more time if you can.
If you have your Bibles, turn with us to the epistle of Romans, the sixth chapter of Romans. We are going to begin a study, something we have not done in quite some time. I think the last time that we did a study on the sixth chapter of Romans was in 2003. And, uh, and I think it's about time that we have another study on the sixth chapter of Romans. Now, we're going to break it up into different sections. And uh, uh, we're, we're going to be dealing, first of all, with the first two verses, Romans 6, verses 1 and 2. And uh, we're just going to have a good time tonight. We're going to get into the Word of God, and we're going to get this study on. And I really believe it's going to be something that's very worthwhile. I mean, every single one of us, you may say, well, Pastor Gabe, especially Bible college students, well, we go over the Romans chapter 6 in Bible college, but it's always good to have a refresher course. It's always good for everyone to have a refresher on, the, on, on this book because I believe it without a shadow of a doubt that this book is the m- most important book in the entirety of the Word of God. And I want you to tell others, if you can, about this study, because I think others need to know what the Bible says about what we face and what our problem is and what our solution is. Romans chapter 6, just reading verses 1 and 2, Paul would write, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we who are dead to sin live any longer therein? And I just want to use for a subject just a study on the sixth chapter of Romans. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight in the name of Jesus. We're so grateful and thankful for the opportunity to minister your word. And we're asking that you would help us tonight to teach your word. Help us tonight to minister your word. Give us clarity of thought, of speech, and of, and of mind. And we ask it in the mighty name of Jesus Christ that you would open the eyes of our heart that we may see you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. I like to refer to the epistle of Romans as the Christian's declaration of independence. As the nation of America has a declaration of independence, that declaration that our forefathers declared in regards to freedom from England, And even though England did not see them as free, they saw themselves as free. And they didn't understand and they didn't realize, well, of course they did realize and understand that by their declaration, by their declaring themselves free from the tyranny of England, that it would cause war, that it would cause a problem, that it would cause a conflict As England wanted to hold on to America, America declared itself free, but it did not happen overnight. It was a process that lasted some years before America finally won her freedom. And it's a direct correlation with the child of God. Before you got saved, the sin nature controlled you, dominated you, ruled you. And when you got saved, that was you declaring yourself free, or actually God declaring you free, God declaring you justified, but that's when the battle began, because the more that you begin to understand grace, the more that you understand or begin to understand Jesus Christ and Him crucified, Satan wanted to hold on, and your war just began, now we'll get to that. And that whole analogy when we get deeper into the chapter. But I look at this chapter, especially this chapter, the sixth chapter of Romans, as the Christian's declaration of independence from the sin nature. It's quite a statement. But everything in the Word of God led to this one moment and this one chapter. It led to this one moment chapter. Now notice this, and I've said this before, but this Bible was not meant for unbelievers. Now there are scores of unbelievers who opened the page of this, of the, of this book and accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, but this book is meant for believers. It is our roadmap to life. It declares to us our freedom 
and the price that Jesus Christ paid for our freedom. We've got to understand that. No one on earth knew how to live for God. No one. The Old Testament saints, they didn't know. The apostles, the disciples, they didn't know. No one on earth knew how to properly live for the Lord until that revelation came to the apostle Paul. Now, I want you to think about something. Paul did not see Christ in the way that the other apostles did. He didn't hear from Christ in the same way that the other apostles did. He saw Christ on the road to Damascus when a bright light shone and blinded him, and he asked, who is this? Who's talking to me? And he said, I'm Jesus the one whom you persecute. You know the story of the Apostle Paul. It was at that moment that he accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. Three days later, healed of those blinded eyes and baptized with the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of God gave the utterance. However, the moment that he was saved, Spirit-filled, he began to preach. He began to teach how that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He began to show people with proof who Jesus Christ is and what he did, what he accomplished for us at Calvary. Except he didn't understand himself how to live for God. Every believer goes through that experience of being saved and then trying to live for God to the best of their ability. When you look at the Apostle Paul, that's exactly what we see. Him saved, baptized with the Holy Spirit, but not yet understanding how to properly live for the Lord. All he knew to do was to trust in what he was doing. Trust in the Mosaic Law. Trust in all of those, 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 those religious activities to try to live for God. But soon he began to realize that something just did not add up. I love God with all of my heart, but yet there's this thing that's here and it's killing me and I don't want to do this anymore. And I don't understand what's causing it. I don't understand the problem that I'm facing right now, that the thing that I don't want to do, that's what I find myself doing and doing constantly. I've been there. I think we all can raise our hand to say that we've been there. Now, you don't have to do it. But we've, been, we've all been in that situation where, we have grown, where we've grown desperate, in you, if you will, desperate to say, Lord, I can't take this anymore. Something has to change. Something has to change. Year after year would go by, and here's this man, Paul, preaching, teaching, seeing things, and more than likely seeing miracles, whatever the case may be, but yet he did not understand how to really and truly live for the Lord. And yet no one else did at that time either. It would come through desperation. That the revelation would come. There's an old saying, and you've heard it said before, that revelation follows desperation. When you get to that place where you're desperate and you don't know what else to do, you don't know where else to turn, you don't know where else to go because you've tried everything else. Even Paul would even, he himself would even say that I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. What in the world did he mean? He mean that the law had nothing to do with his salvation. But after he was saved and even spirit-filled, he did the best that he could to live for God by the best of his own ability. But the moment he began to trust in his, the doing of those things, that sin nature that we'll deal with a little bit in just a moment, came alive. Dominating him once again and not knowing and understanding why. But it's amazing that what he gives us in this sixth chapter... 
He first gives us the problem and the cause of the problem. And it's not just acts of sin. Those are symptoms. But there is always a root problem to the symptom. Did you get that? Anytime that you're sick, you have symptoms. Fever, runny nose, cough, congestion, and the list is on and on. But those are just symptoms to the problem. There's always a root cause. Okay, how many times, how many times have you woken up in the sun, right in the middle of spring? Pollen is everywhere. You go to bed and everything is fine, but all of a sudden the, 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 the eyes start to water and itch. And you find yourself constantly rubbing your eyes. And the next thing you know, sneezing happens. Hutch. Next thing you know, stopped up nose. And you, you talk like this because you just can't breathe out of your nose. People ask you what's wrong and you have to tell them I just can't breathe. And you go to bed, and whenever you go to bed, you can't breathe. You can't breathe out of your nose, so you have to keep your mouth open, and your tongue gets about that thick because you know what I'm saying. Those are all symptoms of a problem, symptoms of a situation. There's always a root cause to the problem. We can always look at the problems that we face and that we deal with and we see the manifestations of those problems and symptoms, whether they be whatever the case may be, but there's always a root problem, and that is sin. Sin. And the Holy Spirit addresses the sin nature first, telling us that is your problem. The problem that you face before you got saved was the sin nature. It controlled you. It dominated you. Everything, and you, you didn't want it. Well, let me just change it. Every sinner, every one of us before we got saved was completely ruled and dominated by the sin nature. It controlled us. And there were times, I know probably many of you, that before you got saved, you didn't really want to do it, but something on the inside of you drove you to do it. Real quiet now. Controlled, dominated. But notice Paul was not writing to unbelievers. He was writing to believers. And even as believers, we have to understand that as believers, we still have a problem. When we got saved, gloriously and wondrously saved, that sin nature that dominate us, dominated us is still there. But we are dead to it. It's not dead to us. Now most, well, I'll, we'll deal with that in a moment. We have to understand that the sin nature has now become dormant. It's now become pushed down, not to bother us anymore. But the more that you depend upon your own strength and abilities, you're going to see that sin nature rise up in your life to dominate and rule once again. And that is in a position that no Christian wants to be in. Paul would write, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Now let's look at this for a moment. What was Paul meaning? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? I want us to break it down just a moment. Let's look at that word continue. Shall we continue? It's a, it's, it's, it's a good choice of words. Shall we continue in sin? That word continue, it means simply to abide, to remain. Another word, you can also put it this way, to remain longer, to continue or abide in or at a place. Shall we remain in sin? Oh, it's real quiet. Paul is saying, shall you continue in sin? Shall you remain in sin just so grace can abound? There is a thought process especially. It's been, it's been around for a long, long time. But it seems like it's becoming more and more prevalent now. 
that it doesn't really matter what you do, grace will cover it. So you can do whatever you want to do, live however you want to live, and grace will cover it. Paul says it right here. The Holy Spirit plainly says, shall you remain in sin? Shall you continue? Shall you abide in sin or the sin nature just so that grace can abound? As a believer, you don't want to sin. As a believer, there's something on the inside of you that doesn't want to do what you used to do, that doesn't want to go to be involved in that which what you used to be involved in. And for whatever reason, if you fail, your heart breaks. I mean, you get, you, 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 you're grieved in your spirit. Lord, I, I can't, I don't want to do this anymore. You show me someone that has no problem sinning and calls himself a Christian, I'll show you somebody that's not a Christian. Oh, I'm going to get real. I'm going to get some emails on that one. Show me someone that has no problem or no conviction in what they do. i show you someone that is a bastard and not a child of God. Oh, use the B word. That's what the Bible tells us. You're not a child of God. If you like and enjoy your sin and you call yourself a Christian, there's a problem there. There is a big problem there. As a believer, you don't want to live that lifestyle. You don't want to sin. You don't want to continue on that road down that path of sin because it leads to destruction. There's nothing good that comes out of failing the Lord or sinning willfully. You know, I had a guy that came up to me. This was many, many years ago. I saw him in church. I shared this before, but there are some of you new that are here, so I'll share it one more time. I had not seen this gentleman in years. He was my age. Hadn't seen him in years. He came to church on a Sunday night, and I remember he walked down to the altar to rededicate his life to the Lord. And I can remember sitting on the platform, and I looked at him. I said, that guy looks familiar. I know that guy from somewhere, and it looks just like so-and-so. And I remember I walked down just to see if it was, and he, he lost some weight. He changed up his look a little bit, but sure enough, it was this young man. And I began to talk to him for a moment and just asking him how he's been. He said, I'll be honest with you. He said, I haven't been good at all. He said, I, I left the church, and he said that, You know me, I'd been going through some things. He said, I really wanted to live for God. But I started attending a church where I live. And he said, it it was strange to me because I never really felt anything when I was there. I knew something was wrong, but I couldn't put my finger on it. And he said, I was wanting to buy a motorcycle. He's cheap on gas, but he said, I love riding motorcycles. And I found a guy in my church that was wanting to sell a motorcycle, and it was the motorcycle that I wanted. And he said, I got in contact with him, and I met up at a certain location. We went to the same church. We were talking about things. But he said every word out of his mouth was the F, was, was the F word. He said every word out of his mouth was vulgarity, talking about how much that he got drunk the night before. And I looked at him, and I said, Don't we go to the same church? Oh, yeah, just as long as we go to church, we're fine. And he sat there and said, that doesn't make any sense to me. Because I I came out of that stuff. I don't want to drink alcohol anymore because it doesn't do me any good. All it causes is heartache and pain. I don't want to cuss anymore. And I don't want to do all that. But here you are saying that, oh, it's okay. Just as long as you show up to church on Sundays, you're good. Young people, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. This is not just an opportunity for you just to come to church to hang out, just to earn you something from God to say, Lord, I showed up on Wednesday night, so I'm good to go for the week. No. As a believer, you don't want to continue in sin. You want to stay as far away from it as humanly possible. But the problem is if we don't understand how to live for God, If we don't understand the cross in regards how it plays in our everyday life and living, we don't understand the Holy Spirit, how he works in our everyday life and living, we're going to be dominated by sin. 
We're going to be dominated. We're going to continue in that. I hate to use that word, but we're going to fail over and over. And we may not understand why. Paul gives us the reason. It's the sin nature. Now, what is the sin nature? The sin nature, well, really, when you look at the word sin, that word sin simply means to miss the mark, right? You got a big bullseye. Let me give you an illustration. Last year, I believe it was last year, I'd, I went with a friend of mine to get, uh, some of you may get offended at this, but, you know, I'll just announce it. I went and got my carry and conceal license. Nobody, yeah, okay, all right. And I can remember we had the all-day class, and at the very end of the class, you had to go to the range and actually, you know, shoot off a couple rounds of ammunition just to see if you actually hit the target. Because if you don't hit the target, they're going to tell you, no, nah, I think you'd be better off just, you know, you need to practice just a little bit. And I can remember, you know, going to the range and, and, and loading up a firearm and, and pulling the trigger a couple times. And, you know, you got the bullseye, the center part, and then you got another round, then you got another ring, then you got another ring, all according to the little silhouette and the body part of the silhouette. As long as you just hit somewhere in those rings, you're good. And I remember being there. I was one of the first ones, me and my friend, one of the first ones. We did fine. I looked at the next guy, and I mean, or the, it was somebody else. And I mean, the moment, it wasn't that far. It's about for me to this camera. And the moment they pulled out that first round, there was no hole in the target. And we all kind of looked like, I don't want to be around that person. Just using this as an example, so don't get crazy now. But sin means to miss the mark. If you miss the mark, there is a target that you're aiming for, which is living a holy life. But if you miss that mark, it's sin. But what Paul is talking about here, it's more than just missing the mark. It's a nature that is embedded on the inside of every single one of us, that inner bent to do that which is wrong. We're born with it. Every one of us are born with the nature that inner bent to do that which is against God. Bob likes to say it this, we're born scrambled. How many like scrambled eggs? I love scrambled eggs. I don't eat it enough, but I love scrambled eggs. You better know it. Put some cheese on it, put some syrup on it, you got, you're good to go. Whoo, my Lord. Snow, you know what I'm talking about. Man, man, I can, man my mouth's starting to water right now. I'm going to make myself some scrambled eggs and syrup when I get home. Get some biscuits in there. Mm, my goodness, good old southern breakfast. <laughs> when you take an egg and break it and scramble it, it is flat impossible for anyone to sit back and piece that egg back together, right? That's how we are. Born scrambled because of sin. Because of one man that took place thousands of years ago when he disobeyed the command of God not to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Eve was deceived. Adam just straight up disobeyed. He wasn't deceived. He knew better. He just straight up disobeyed. And when he disobeyed, it brought the whole human race down. He was our federal head in regards to the human race. And when he fell, he could now only bring sons and daughters of Adam into this world. Those in the likeness of Adam. And because he fell, guess what? That disqualifies all of us. Thank you, Adam. We're all disqualified. We're all scrambled, and I mean bad scrambled, with no way to fix ourselves. But that's the great thing about being saved. We have to start this race disqualified. That's how we become qualified. We start off disqualified, understanding our whole life is scrambled, but we know somebody. I said we know somebody. 
I said, we know somebody that can take those scrambled eggs and piece them back together as though it was never broken to begin with. That's good stuff. I can't do that. In my own power, I can't take that scrambled egg. I can't put together Humpty Dumpty back together again. Can't do it. Never will be able to. I can't qualify myself. I'm going to get in trouble now. You can't qualify yourself by how much money you give. You can't qualify yourself by praying to a dead saint. You can't qualify yourself by showing up to church. Ooh. You can't qualify yourself. But God, when he looks down at a scrambled egg like you and me, says, I can fix that. I can fix that problem. I can take that problem of being scrambled and piece by piece take that scr- and Look, you know what a scrambled egg looks like. It doesn't resemble an egg. But God can take it all and put it all back together again, piece by piece, little by little. He can do it by himself. He doesn't need my help. Shall we continue? Shall we remain? Shall we abide in the sin nature? That nature, we're born with it. Our three daughters, Sam, Abby, and Caroline, I'll never forget with each one I was in the operating room. When they put that little baby in my arms, and I remember with Sam, I, I, I was so scared and nervous. Because really, to be honest, I didn't, I didn't like holding babies. Because I was afraid I was going to drop it. But when it came to my own, it's a different ball game. And I put that baby in my arm. I'm sitting there thinking, I don't know how to hold this thing. I got to figure out how to hold this thing right. But when I looked at Sam, I'll never forget it. She came out, not a tear, not a scream. She opened her eyes, yawned, and went right back to sleep. They had to get her to scream. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, don't, oh, Lord, don't do that, please. You know, I wasn't didn't know. Now, when Abby came out, ah! and she ain't stopped yet. But with each child, in my eyes, as beautiful as they were, this is my flesh and blood. This is my child. But knowing this, I still knew on the inside that they're born disqualified with the nature that is bent to do that which is against God. And that sin nature has driven so many people, believers, into a place where they would just quit and give up. Now next week, I'm running out of time. Singers, musicians, make your way. Next week, we're going to look at the sin nature a little bit closer. We're going to look at, see how the church views the sin nature, what they see, how they see the sin nature. And we're going to cover five areas in which the church views the sin nature, so I don't want you to miss it. I want you to be here next week. I probably will not to get, you know, I will, more than likely will not be able to get through all five. I'll get through maybe one or two, and we'll continue it on until we get through it. But we're going to continue on with this chapter. And I really believe, at least it's going to minister to me in studying and preparation. This is ministering to me because even though I've read this chapter, taught this chapter, am teaching this chapter, it still ministers to my heart. Because I, I, I need a refresher course to see what my problem is and my solution to that problem. Stand to your feet. Let's just have a word of prayer before we dismiss. Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. We're so grateful and thankful for who you are, for what you've done. Lord, we're asking that you would touch every heart in life as we leave this place tonight. As we dismiss, 
We ask that you would go with each and every single person. We ask that you would continue to open doors for them that no man can shut. During these last few weeks of school, we're asking that you would give them mercy. We ask that you would help them to study to prepare for their final exams. And we're asking that as they leave for the summer, that you would bring them back safely. We ask it in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. As they sing it one more time, I want us just to turn around and hug some necks and shake some hands and tell everybody that you'll be back, ne be back next week. Tell them I'm going to be back next week, 7 o'clock, right here, Crossfire. We love you. God bless you. We'll be back. Thank you so much for joining us today for this service, this weekly Crossfire service. And I want, I want you just to remember us if you can, not only with your financial support with this network, but with your prayers as well. God has called us to reach the young people of this generation and of this world. And so we're asking you not only for your financial support, but for your prayer for support. Thank you for being with us here tonight. We're going to be, I'm, I'm believing God that's going to bless you and enrich you and enrich our young people. We love you. God bless you.